Uh, we are starting the afternoon sessions, and uh, Josh will talk to us about security with both the group policies. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Too loud. If I get too loud, just tell me to. All right. Perfect. Uh, I guess I got this. I'm not sure. I feel like Bradley Spears. <laughs> 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 all right, so my name is uh, Josh Reed. First, I would, before we start, I actually want to thank all the sponsors. Give them a round of applause. Without them, this, this conference would not happen, which is awesome to see. So many cool people. Like, you all are cool. Really cool. Uh, but just seeing all of them come in here and actually you know, help and, and sponsor and actually uh, provide kind of uh, support as well as, you know, they get the benefit of us talking to them about their products. So let's talk about securing windows with group policy. Ponyto? Right. Okay. <laughs> so, securing windows with group policy. Uh, is anyone here familiar with group policy or use it on a daily basis? A weekly basis? Monthly? <laughs> Yearly? Okay. All right. um, before we dive in, that is, uh, that is actually me. <laughs> Don't ask me why, I do. And uh, my name is Josh Rickard. I've worked seven years in IT, uh, probably eight or so. Um, I have some certs, whatever. Um, my main focus, though, is Windows security, digital forensics, and PowerShell. I do a lot of PowerShell. Uh, I should add Python because I'm getting into that as well. But, but um, so before we get into you know all the, the nitty gritty of what you can do, I wanted to kind of make sure that you understood how group policy actually works in general, and one of the big concepts is how it actually applies or how it actually works. Has anyone ever heard of this acronym? LSDOU. Sounds good. Uh, LSD OU is just the way that group policy applies to your machines. Uh, L is the same And then you have a site based group policy. And then you have a domain based group policy. And then organizational units underneath those. You kind of think of these different layers of where things can be applied. And then we'll break it down a little bit further. Local. Local. This is like chaos, right? Just unicorns are dying, pterodactyls are flying, and it's just unmanaged. It's not fun. Um, you can use local group policies, but just like with every other piece of group policy, you apply it by machine or user or a group which contains users. Uh, but it's user or machine. So depending on where you're at when you're applying your policy, is whatever is underneath it is going to affect it. So if you have it at the top of your OU structure and all your sub units. If you're applying machine policy, it will only apply to machines. There's some edge cases here. But with this, it's free for all with the local group policy. You can just go into your, your Windows machine and you know, just change settings as you want. It's really hard. If you want to go to like every single workstation you want to set make sure the checklist is good, uh, probably not. It'll get real tedious real fast. So it, it, it's unmanaged. The next is the site. We kind of take sites as individual countries or regions of, of policies. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at a couple here, but you have the United States, Canada, Russia, whatever it is. Uh, each one of those have a site, and it's usually based on a few things location or based on your network topology. So a subnet. Um, there's other edge cases, but th those are typically uh, what you see. So in this example, you can actually see the United States. It has a couple of domain controllers, uh, but it's all based on your network range or whatever that subnet is, or, or a network. It could be multiple subnets, whatever it is. So site-based policies, you don't run across them very much unless you're really, really big. I have never seen a proper one, but Microsoft has a ton of documents. Uh, I think maybe Microsoft and like, huge, huge organizations. The next level, though, is what we're going to call domains. So in our analogy, 
we can look at the entire United States as one big site, and each individual state is a domain. So we have California, New York, and Missouri, right? Let's, let's just look at Missouri as a single domain. So, well, back up. So imagine we have a site, and the entire site is the United States. And at that site level, we actually have federal laws, right? You, you can't kill someone, you have to pay taxes, uh, right to bear arms, whatever, whatever those laws are. Uh, but they impact everything underneath it, so all of the debates. But each individual domain has its own laws, like state laws. Right? Um, the state of Missouri has a different tax rate, and you, know, you have to pay taxes in Missouri. Uh, you have to pay property taxes, so on and so forth. So each, wherever you're at, based on your location, will actually have different laws or policies that they have to uh, abide by. Let's skip down to organizational units. So we have our sites, which we have our federal laws. We have our, our local uh, or state domain laws. And then you can actually break it down even further. So I live in Columbia, Missouri, and so it's Boone County. And Boone County has certain laws for a given tax rate. Um, if, if you shop there, I think it's like 7.8% you know, on, on sales tax. Or, you know, you have different laws where, you know, um, we have to, we're going to pass this initiative to provide parks or some sort of, you know, benefit to the community. But it only impacts us at this level and everything underneath it. So if you own a house there, it actually impacts your street or, or your house. So if you here owns or owns a house that has a homeowners association, know somebody in it probably is right? they have one depending on what your homeowners association is i don't but my, my neighbors weird it's a weird layout uh, my neighbors do and you know they have to abide by certain laws they, they pay into this you know you have to pay 600 300 whatever it is a month. um and you like your hedges can't be above six foot um you can't have tires on your front lawn and You've got to keep your grass so high. Whatever, whatever those laws are, they impact your location or where you're at. So whether it's a, a machine, let's just call it a house or, or something in your house, uh, or a user, me or my family, if I apply a policy at the street level of this organization, it will apply for anything. These laws of organizational units can then follow even further down. They can go as far as you want. You go to your house, you have individual policy or laws governing your house. Meaning, uh, I, I don't have any children, but if I wanted to say, you cannot use the internet until after your homework's done and no later than 10 p.m., I can apply that law and it's, it's governance. It doesn't impact you, it doesn't impact anything else you know, above me. It's not a state law, it's, it's only at my organizational level. below. Again, you can have these organizational units all the way down to individual rooms, right? You can't watch TV past a certain time. Whatever these laws are or these policies, you can, you can enact them. You can even go all the way down to your refrigerator. If you, had, uh, if you were in college and you had a whole bunch of guys or whatever sitting in a uh, bureau, you know, you may put a lock on your refrigerator, but like, oh, I'm not going to let people eat my food or whatever it is. Uh, you may have those laws. So again, we have, we have the, the federal laws, which are the you know, site-based through policy. We have domains for each individual state. And those are default domain policy. You've probably heard of that or seen it. Um, it impacts everything underneath that domain, um, as well as you know, each individual organizational unit. So now let's get into the juicy stuff. Managing users, uh, it's a fun task, you know, but there's a lot of things you can do with group policy that are um, pretty, pretty powerful. So what do you, any, anyone recognize these groups or these, these types or names? Yeah, 
schema elements, domain elements, how are you I'm cheating here, backup operators, you know, enterprise elements, whatever it is, these are highly protected groups. Right? You want to protect these at all costs. If, if someone gets uh, domain controllers, if, if, well, the, let's go with something a little bit better. Uh, just administrator or account operators, that, that means if they're an account operator, they can actually go in and start creating accounts and creating accounts and doing other things that you don't want them to. If someone gets domain admins, schema admins, enterprise admins, whatever those are, you're screwed. Call them somebody. You're not going to get that. I guarantee you. But there's ways we can kind of just add protection or layers of defense. You know, there's not a one stop gap. There's attacks every day that keep coming out, and vulnerabilities, and everything that will actually prevent this. Uh, or, you know, try to get access to those accounts. But uh, you can try to make it as hard as possible for your attackers. One of the things is called uh, restricted groups. We'll go right here. Imagine, now I'm just going to throw this situation out. You, you are a user. And a user called, you're an IT guy, and you have domain and you log in using those domain credentials and all that. Um, a user comes over to you and says, hey, uh, there's something funky going on with my computer. I don't know what the heck is going on. Okay, IT guy goes over, logs in the machine, and off to the races we go. You're, you're, you're done. Because he has so many rights as an admin or as a privileged account. Even as if you have separated accounts from a regular traditional account to a you know admin and IT account, whatever it is, he now could put a login script on the machine. And as soon as you log in, use your security access, so we can talk about that, or use your privileges to actually go and create an account and put it in the main admins just on login. Because he has rights. So you're using his credentials to do things. And he doesn't know it, but you just created a, an account with an admin to make sure. Pretty easy. It's not, uh, it's not a rocket science. You don't need to download anything. It's all built in there. If you join the, even if you're not joining the, you can access all these libraries and crap on, on the system. So in that situation, you become rallies. Right? You, you just like, Free for all. Ah, oh, let everyone do whatever the hell they want. Okay. <laughs> but what? <laughs> so, but but like just like at home, right? You you don't you have Wi-Fi. It's like, do you just let anybody come into your Wi-Fi? Please, if you do, just tell me later and we'll talk. I have a confessional set up outside. <laughs> But you know, you you secure. Like when my family comes in, I have a guest network. I have a you know my regular network. I'm a little on my regular. Tell my parents, like, don't bring your crap to my my home. Like, use this other thing. The second, thing, you protect. Even if you don't want to go to that level, you at least you know maybe have some content filtering for kids or whatever it is. You just try to protect it as best as possible. You don't just like let it have a free flow. Maybe you do. Uh, but you shouldn't. But you, you know, I understand. It's a lot of maintenance and other stuff. But you, you need to, you know, manage your users and not just like accept that. Oh, okay, well, if they know the password, everything's good. It's like, yeah. uh, they could be downloading a lot of things. Anyone ever received a DCMA uh, request from home? I mean, I have like downloading illegal stuff, and I mean, I didn't. Um, but like, you know, like if they were doing that on your network, who's gonna get blamed? Not, not them, I mean, it's gonna be you. Because it's at your house. So protect them. So restricted groups is one way that we can actually do these. I you can do this for every single group or every single account on, on your network, but it's gonna be a lot of maintenance. You probably script it a lot. But at least for your your very, very high privilege accounts, like domain admins, enterprise admins, scheme admins, whatever. You want to actually use this restricted groups. And so what it does is, in this location, which is under policies, Windows settings, security settings, restricted groups, and you can actually add what group you want to be restricted. And so here I'll say domain admin. 
And who I want to be in that group is actually an admin account and then another user account that I agree. This is a test of me. So I added that, that those members to that specific group. Imagine a malicious user that we talked about earlier created an account using a login script or whatever, injected themselves into domain independence, cleared out everyone else, and put in their own malicious user account. Right. So you you have this malicious user now in there. It's like, oh crap, they have to learn that. Gotta go brush up the resume. Uh, with restricted groups now though, anyone familiar with group policy refresh or how it refreshes? So by default it's like every 90 minutes the group policy will refresh. You can change that, but by default it's every 90 minutes. And because of these global, these global groups are actually on a, um, well, they're in an AD and not a specific like, machine or like, something like that, um, they will actually update every single time the group policy refreshes. So if you take that average of 90 minutes uh, per refresh across all of your machines, let's say you have 10,000 machines, it's like every two minutes it's going to refresh. And it's quite a bit. Uh, so if, if someone does inject themselves into the end, all of a sudden they just get kicked out. Because I already specified on the policy of restricted groups that I only want these users. Anyone else just gets replaced. I don't care either. We'd be automatically just uh, protect our group. Again, this is not a stopgap, but it does make it really, really difficult to keep a hold of um, highly privileged accounts. You can restrict permissions on this, uh, who can edit this policy, and so on and so forth. But um, using restricted groups is very, very beneficial, especially for those high level users. I, I don't know how to do it. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, so, user rights. So, we talked about managed users. We understand you know, how group policy applies. It still applies to you know, across all of our uh, different categories we'll talk about today. But, managing user rights is probably one of the most important. Um, who here on their machines has users that run as administrators? Or have administrator levels? <laughs> really? Like only two people? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. I'm shocked. Um, because it's pretty prevalent. You know, unless you have you know, really strict policies and you, know, you can protect those. Usually, users are administrators or can run as an administrator. So with user rights, just like when you buy a house, right? anything that you do when you buy a house, first thing I do is I, well, I only buy them two houses, <laughs> but I don't buy them like on Tuesdays. Um, but like buying a new home, I replace the locks, okay? You know, with just like the old people that, that used to live there to come over and just start like digging through my stuff. It's just like when you install Windows. Everyone assumes that Windows is automatically secure and you know, ready to go, and like, right out the box, we're good. Even if you have a gold image and like, all, all this stuff, it doesn't really matter that there's so many different levels of privileges that are allowed by default that you can restrict and manage and pare down and still give people administrative rights. So, privileges, love this. Guy, some new banana thing. I don't know. Um, <laughs> random things. I, I told one of my uh, guys uh, that that worked for me. Uh, hey, we hope you just like put things randomly into this. This is awesome. You keep it. So, so uh, shout out to Clint. If you ever see this? So <laughs> privileges. These are some highly. So you, you can see the list in the background, right? I'm only just kind of briefly talking about some of the, the ones that are highlighted, but these are highly privileged uh, user rights or privileges that we can restrict to, to help protect our organization. Active part of the operating system. Anybody know what that means? Okay. So as a user, you can act as you are the operating system. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like you, you as a user can act as the operating system. Why? Why would you ever need to act as part of the operating system? Like let the operating system do that. Like you as your user account should never be delegated or, or be able to act as part of the operating system. Of course, there might be some legacy software, there might be some other you know software out there that that uh, it may need this. It's a testing case. All this on the interface as a test it out in the lab or, you know, whatever. Um, but a lot of the cases, you're not going to need this privilege. Create a token object. And the by token is actually a security access token, SMT. We'll talk about that. But as a user, even if you're, like, if you're an IT user, a developer, whatever, um, you may need to debug programs. Because you're compiling code, you're, you're modifying code, blah, blah, blah. But it's normal. Um, Mary, the executive assistant, you know, like, does she need to debug the programs? No, no, not at all. You don't have to have that. Uh, you can remove these rights from built-in groups within your uh, operating system. Impersonate after, uh, impersonate a client after authentication. Uh, load and unload device drivers. Restore files that are used. Take ownership of them. These are very suspicious, but by default, uh, we can see, and I'll, and I'll talk about this, but on all of these, pretty close that they'll tell you in the, in the actual details, but administrators, local service, network service, service, all has these rights. And uh, an administrator doesn't need those rights. So impersonating a, a, a client privilege. When we think of how a group policy you know, a segment. You, you can test this out in your individual machines or individual, you know, organization or units. Um, maybe you have certain departments that may need this privilege, some others that don't. So as long as you apply those policies at whatever level that you need to, um, you, you can actually secure you know, a lot of these processes. So one thing I want to point out on these slides is in the very bottom left-hand corner is SE impersonate privilege, SE create global privilege. Those are actually uh, lower level win uh, API level um, methods that um, give you this privilege. I mean, uh, with PowerShell, with, 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 with anything on Windows, you can basically call this. And uh, it's pretty, pretty easy to do. Uh, so, security access tokens. What you can do with a security access token, and I'll break this down on the next slide, but you can actually use your authentication rights on your domain. So if you're a domain admin, I can say, let's, let me impersonate whoever the, that set or permissions are for this process. So I can say, okay, let's run calculator as domain admin, but let's run mini as domain admin. It, it's, it, you, you can impersonate that client privilege. It's used mostly to like steal network services or to Traverse networks. Um, they'll actually use it to you know, authenticate to Jumpbox or to another box, whatever. Um, and, well, that, that's, that's the reason. This is what a, a security access token looks like. So well, imagine you have a processor thread, and inside of it you have an access token, a security access token. And it's really made out of, you know, anybody know what a SID is? It's like that, that weird you know, string that you see in a registry and uh, uh, your user SID, what groups you belong to, uh, um, privilege information, as well as other access information, which we get into uh, SACL and DACL, which are security uh, access controllers. Um, uh, what is it? Do you, uh, I have to do with this. But, Really, that they're made up of you know individual access rights. Can you access this process? Can you access this file? Can you whatever? Everything in security goes around these DACL and, and SACL uh, privileges. When specifically is so with an impersonated client person, you can actually say, okay, as, as, as a thread, I want to attach this object or view this thing, uh, network authentication, whatever it is. I can use that. If they can just capture one, if they just capture one of your domain admin across the network or on a box, then now they can act as a domain admin with a chunk of data that they have. Uh, anyway, doesn't matter where it's at. 
So this is a really quick example of a little GIF, GIF, whatever. Uh, Incognito.exe. Uh, this is just a utility out there. I just did this last night. I'm going to kind of show an example. But uh, you can download this from, I think it's M uh, MRW Labs, uh, Mr. Labs. And uh, you can just download it. Incognito.exe. And then I uh, put in the command on switch list underscore tokens, cash you as a user. And here are all the user or my tokens, second security access tokens, that could be delegated and used against an attack. It's super easy. Um, most, most attackers will, will do this. Debug programs. Again, I see debug program. We'll talk more about that in the next, but uh, it's a highly, highly, um, um, I'm just going to read so it says, grants and read write access to, to user and kernel level on kernel mode memory. So as a user, I can access the kernel memory space with this bridge. That's how you do both software. Right? You have to get into that. You don't need it. Like, you're like, yes, your developers may need it. Yes, you may need it. Yes, maybe IT needs it. But a traditional user does never need to actually access that memory. Just let the process do its stuff. Um, they, they inject crap, you know, passwords, they try to get hashes out of memory, whatever it is. Um, again, a lot of us is usually hash hash attacks. Um, they extract them. Uh, AD accounts, so if you log in or RDP. Anybody uh, familiar with the difference between interactive and non-interactive uh, log uh, authentication? All right, so this wasn't really playing with, but um, so interactive authentication is like RDP. Like when you remote desktop and do a computer, it's an interactive log login or authentication. If you are logging in as um, even even um, PowerShell, uh, will actually do a interactive uh, login unless you use WSMAN with, with a whole bunch of other stuff. But just just like that. Um, a non-interactive would be um, uh, like a, a greatest example of it, probably. Like SSH, it's the other version of it. There, there's PS Session and PS Remoting. Uh, PS Remoting is interactive. PS Session is, is an actual non-interactive authentication. You'll be by it. Um, so it's, there, there's two different types of authentication. And uh, you don't want interactive. Uh, because it actually caches your login credentials. So when you log into a computer uh, through remote desktop or even locally, like sitting at the computer, uh, you have an interactive session and it stores that that uh, your your SID, your your user SID, all all the information, basically your security access to what you are authenticated to do or you have access to is all right there. So if they just compromise one machine that you don't think is a uh, important if it's some junk server, uh, but you log in with a highly privileged account, they now have that and can use it to be glad of it pretty easily. So non-interactive um, authentication doesn't it doesn't store that it's only temporary. Petya. Anyone remember Petya? This is a, a little while ago, probably August. It's a big ransomware cover. So Petya, uh, this is actually by Carbon Black. So you can go to that too. But uh, they, they did a, a breakdown of what this actually piece of malware does. And, uh, a lot of malware uses these privileges. Yeah. SE debug print is the first they they check to see hey, does they have do they have permission to shut down a computer? Can they restart? Can they reboot? Whatever it is. Do they, does that user have that privilege? Um, do, do they have the right to debug? Yes. Uh, do they have the right to take owning process and act as part of the operating system? Yeah, they do. All right. Once we have those, we're good. We're off to the races. We're going to affect you and you are done. You're not going to uncover this. Using these, these built-in processes, almost, I don't have clear data. So, Cabinets, but about 90% that I've ever seen from any type of modern malware 
uses these two privileges and others as well. So imagine if you can actually remove these privileges from your administrator accounts. So if something does get downloaded as a user context, um, they'll check these and then exit if they can. Or if they have advanced logic and how they check for other privileges, but it gets harder and harder for them to, to, to uh, attack. This is just easy. You know, this is all fair. So uh, by removing these, we can actually protect our machines quite a bit um, because of these built-in checks. Think of malware, like if anyone's not familiar with malware and how it works, it's just like every other software. If you install, uh, I don't know, let's just say Outlook 2016, you can install it on Windows 98, maybe, but probably not. It does, you know, a pre-check, like before, to make sure you're meeting the minimum requirements. Malware does the same thing. It's just doing it at a lower level. Logon rights. So with logins, with, with users, you can actually you know, protect what they can have access to and what, what they do. So I recommend with your policies, you actually you know, deny your access. Like, uh, if it's a server, do they need to log on locally to the machine? Are you ever going to go to the box, pull out a USB keyboard, plug it in and your server? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, there's some cases. But for the most part, you can just deny it. You're never going to do it. Um, you also, you know, did I log on through remote desktop services or allow? It's specifically allow. Don't just like leave it as its default. You need to specify what users have access to RDP and what don't. Um, and specifically deny anybody that you have caught you know, broken your policy or not. Removing information. Whatever it is, you can apply it again at your global scale, uh, at your domain scale, or individually as you. Uh, here's an example that there's a lot of user rights uh, again in here. It's under uh, computer policies, uh, policy and security settings, local policies, user rights. There's tons of them in here. Um, create a page file, a token object, again, we showed these a little bit earlier. It's kind of blurry, isn't it? So, um, there's a lot in there. Yeah, and dig through it. Don't be, don't be afraid of your policy. That, that's the big thing. Um, it's it's all happening. They usually have pretty good detail. Uh, they're pretty precise with their language. So uh, pay attention to the word. But um, play with it. Do it in a default or some weird organization. It's not going to break anything above it. Another thing is with local users and groups, uh, there's a bunch of built-in ones by default. If you're a local account or, or not, um, they have a lot of these different groups. Um, Desktop users, uh, event log readers, uh, account operators, whatever it is. Um, and you can actually, with your policy, replace those. So the default is like administrator and, and remote desktop users, and all, all these uh, different type of local accounts have access to these type of groups. But what we can do is we can remove administrators from those accounts, uh, from uh, remote desktop users, like a local administrator, or just anyone in the administrator's group. And replace it with just your like one IT person or you, whoever it is, and automatically it will just update this group on those local machines, for the local accounts as well as your um, admins on that on that box. Pretty cool. One example is that users probably going to be like dumb for their demo or ever. You know, I, I don't really know users that, that know what the event log means. Uh, so. You know, that's just an example where you can replace your users to only have like maybe a service account across your domain that, that can do that job, um, that can um, has access to modify or do anything with the other one. So, yeah, you can, you can replace them, you can update them, you can create them, you can create new ones, however you want. Test schedule. So, you know, just like with everything else, you have to have your repeat task. I don't know what this. Um, you have a repeat task. Just like when you, uh, you know, I have home automation, right? And in my home automation, yeah, um, I, I, you know, I'd say, hey, turn my temperature off, um, you know, or turn it, turn it down at, at night or in the morning, whatever it is, you have your home automation. Those are just like scheduled tasks, right? 
you can actually go in and, and uh, create these repeatable tasks that are always wrong. It's one of the most secure ways that you can actually run code uh, or utilities remotely. But you have to use it. So here's a list of the least at the top uh, to the most privileged accounts or services uh, to use in your organization uh, when you're running scheduled tasks. Local service uh, is great. You use that at the beginning. But if you need to access like, uh, a network, an API, if you have a PowerShell script or Bash, whatever it is, um, you may have to use the actual network service. It still doesn't give you system level access to that running process, which is, which is great. You, local service still has some, some threat, but you're not going to be able to go anywhere besides that machine. Right? Uh, network service, you're going to be able to do some network stuff, but at least you're not getting domains, you're not, you're not getting actual uh, user accounts, and you're only getting them on that machine in that network service. But, there's even better than called immediate scheduled tasks. So if you remember saying like network service, local service, all that, can actually be delegated. Your security access to it can be delegated, can be compromised, used for other things. But with immediate scheduled tasks, which are different, uh, you, you have some advantage. So to actually do this, uh, you go into your yeah, control panel setting, scheduled task, say I want to do an immediate, I'm going to run as local service. I'm going to run this PowerShell script that's in, on my file share, whatever it is. Um, and then I want to run whether the user is logged in and run as high as it is. It's possible. Because secure code is execution. So you, you, you get that, that benefit of running whether the user is logged in or not. So no one can be sitting on a machine as long as it's on. The next time your policy approaches, you're going to get it. Uh, do not store any passwords. You don't use user accounts or anything like that. And you run at the highest, you know, system level or whatever you want. Privileges. Great thing about this. Uh, again, I have a network service, but um, great thing is that that SAP, that security access to it, can only be used once, and it can only be used on that machine at that time, and can never be deleted. It's built. There's some magic behind, behind the walls of Microsoft. I don't know how well they do. Because everything else in the world of Microsoft uses those security access tokens. But um, if you are able to uh, break it or you know, compromise that, uh, tell Microsoft, but tell me to. Because I've loved it. Uh, I have not seen anyone break this as of yet. And it's secure code execution. Better than PowerShell remoting. Than any, anything else that you can do uh, by just running it once. And the great thing is when you run it, it'll just apply uh, across all your machines. And next time that your policy refreshes and your machine is interval, within 30 minutes, you have all your results. Managed services. It's not the other one. Right? Uh, individual services live on different machines. Uh, if you go to your services uh, in the control panel or whatever, it, you, you see uh, all the running services. So this list here, long list, like there's like a hundred or whatever. This is the default services. About, I think it's like 65% of these are all actually running on a brand new Windows Server 2016 machine. And the others are just sitting there waiting to, to run or they're just but Still a huge list, right? But let's say you have a Windows or an IIS web server that you that you're deploying, right? Um, really, in actuality, I need is those eight for a base, you know, IIS server. Disable all the other ones. Like you don't need them. Like they're not. Why would you need plug and play on a web server? Like, why do you need? Uh, sorry, I'm going to go actually go back here. Um, uh, VS Polar, uh, you know, port folder. Like, I, I, I don't know. Like, you, you don't need them. So turn them off. If you're not using them, turn them off. Because that just leaves you up to exploitation. Like, if those ports and, and those services are running uh, and they're vulnerable to something, I mean, yeah, it'd be awesome if we could all patch our stuff like every Tuesday and it's on the latest, greatest thing. No, that's not the reality. I wish it was. 
Well, you know, just limit your scope of just how you know your, your attack vector is. So, whoops. What just happened? Oh, sorry. All right. So this is how you actually do it. There, there is group policies in there. You can actually there's a big, huge list depending on your domain level and all that. But you can actually go through and disable, enable. You can set other uh, edit security. What users can run that service. All of a sudden, you can manage all the Windows services on your machine through your policy. And it will back. So if you have a cluster of Windows servers that are all the same or you need know, the same thing, just put them all in one container in your uh, organization will be in a great structure and then just apply the policy on it. And that's your configuration menu. This is something really cool. Oh boy, again, I'm, I'm kind of running through this, but um, process mitigation. So this is new in Windows Server 2016, um, domain functional 2016. Anyone ever heard of Emmet? E-M-E-T, right? It was an awesome tool. So Emmet, for the people that don't know, was uh, you, you could actually uh, protect individual processes and then put a policy on the machines. It's kind of like uh, anti-malware uh, protection, kind of like Apple here with Ronald, and that uh, is a weird category. But with, with new windows, we can actually specify our region. I love Stinky Pie and Potty. Anyone here is Potty? Potty? Yeah. I thought it was great. Uh, so with, with process mitigation, you, you have a, a few things. Have you ever heard of these? DEP, CI, ASLR? All right. A DEP is uh, Data Execution Prevention. That means that you're going to protect certain pieces of memory so that other processes can't put themselves into that piece of memory. Uh, you know, CIOP, structure, exception, and overnight. That's really to protect against both overflow attacks. Uh, then ASLR is address space layout organization. Uh, Windows XP was really bad at this. Um, they didn't randomize when you started up a computer. They would always put like their VRLs in the same place in the memory. So like malware author would be like this is easy. Like, I, don't, I, don't have to, I know exactly what the law I'm going to replace with my stuff. Now I have uh, Trojans. <laughs> so uh, with Windows 7, I got better. Windows 10 is great. Uh, what this does is those DLLs are loading a crap. It just ran, it's never the same. Uh, it, so you can't, it's much harder to have, you know, uh, Trojans and, and rootkits. Uh, but with that process mitigation, you see those question marks? Uh, like one, it's really hard to see, but they have this tool called process mitigation. And you can actually specify uh, DEP, CIA, and ASLR for each individual process now. So instead of applying it for the entire computer, because it may break like some legacy apps that you have, well, you can protect um, the, you know, individual uh, applications and you can actually specify, oh, okay, I want uh, ASLR, but I always want it to go from the bottom up instead of the top down, and switch it up on it. This is more advanced, but if you're mature enough, you can actually uh, go through here. I have all these things that are in uh, blogs and, and graphs that you can, I'll show you that uh, You actually specify a, a one, or a zero, or a one, or a question mark, so zero is off, uh, and disabled one is enabled, question mark is the as it is. Uh, I hope that this gets better. This is really, really hard to manage, uh, <laughs> even for me. So um, it's kind of neat. scripting. Yay! PowerShell. Love PowerShell. I write PowerShell all the time. Love it. I have tons of PowerShell tools out there. I just love it. If you ever just want to, hey, let's write PowerShell. I'm like, yes, come on over. Um, <laughs> my wife and I do but. Um, part of your policy that you can do is uh, enable all the logging. Any logging that you see in your policy, there's tons of it. I have four of them here. Uh, turn on module logging, actual script log logging, and script logging. Turn it on. Just turn it on. Turn it on. Also, you want to log down your IPs. So if you can remote it to or use PowerShell remoting, specify like which I, you know, your IT machines can only use this or, or whatever. Um, you want to actually specify it, not just put a star in there, and that just means like everything. <laughs> Anybody want to put a computer in the or nothing? Protect it. 
Also, digitally sign your scripts. I mean, the reason I, I, I say that with the login is that part of these commands that, that you see will be like dash N O P dash uh, B dash, you know, you see some obfuscated like PowerShell commands and attacks. And what that means is that if, even if you digitally sign, um, you, you, you can bypass any execution policy. As like no bypass or no, <laughs> no profile bypass um, run as whatever execution method you want. It's great, but if you digitally sign, then you set a standard in your organization that anything that is using those weird command and dash and all this other stuff, your users and your IT people should not be doing it because you have set a standard when you digitally sign. So they don't need to do it. It really just adds that layer of defense and that maturity in your um, scripting. So, a uh, use immediate scheduled task, again. I have a few, I'm still good. Uh, so, JEA, just real quick, just enough administration. Uh, JEA is a, is a new thing with, with PowerShell and uh, Microsoft Team. That, uh, let's say you want to give a user an actual login to reset principle or to principle. But they require to have Do you want to give help desk for whatever that user is? Full admin or two box? Probably not. So with JEA, you can actually specify, I only want you to run these PowerShell commands. Even custom ones that you've written, if you want to. But you can use the built-ins. And just say, all right, when they log into that box, you'll create a virtual account and only allow them to do that action and nothing they have full admin rights, but just over that little process. Uh, it's really, really cool. <laughs> um, this is going to be the standard uh, going forward in the cloud and now that for Microsoft is JMO. AppLocker is a thing called constrained language mode. So combined with uh, AppLocker, you can block PowerShell in your environment. If you want to block it, this is the way you can do AppLocker. <laughs> I need this uh, server functional or I think partial 5.1 or anything I have to think for constraint language mode, there, there's a couple different language modes built into PowerShell and they're kind of hidden in the matter. It doesn't mean like spoken language, it's just means like what dot net or C sharp language uh, that you have access to. And so there's like regular uh, language constrained, um, restricted language. And no language. And so this allows you to run certain things out of commands and such. Uh, with constrained language mode, you can restrict uh, PowerShell almost completely. With no language, you're not going to be able to run anything with PowerShell. Example, if you want to do, this isn't your policy, but if you just wanted to go to your machine and type in an environmental variable, underscore, underscore, PS lockdown policy, set it to four, and then open up PowerShell, and all you're going to see is a row. They can't load it. The PowerShell can't, the engine cannot work. Um, that's just on that constraint. Um, but with that environmental variable, I as a user can go in there and write it out easily. So that's why uh, AppLocker is the huge benefit of that, because it restricts it and makes sure that that uh, setting is always good. App Locker. I love the internet. So it's not really that scary. Uh, everyone thinks it is, and there's some benefits. So when you're trying to you know, use App Locker against EACs, anyone know what App Locker is? Like, I want to make sure that application white listing, black listing, uh, you would say only certain applications can run and the restrictions. Um, with this, you can actually say, okay, only these DLLs, only this EXE, scripts, whatever can be ran. Uh, but there's three different conditions that you have to use. And it's a hash condition, path condition, and whatever. Hash condition. Um, this is like every single file, you, you can specify that a hash is needed to actually execute. 
So it has to, does this file match my allowable hash? If it does, then it's okay to run. If not, why? Like, bad thing is every single update that you ever do has a different hash because the code changes. So it's really hard to manage. Path, <laughs> path condition. Uh, this one's actually pretty good, but um, you can actually select an entire suite of products, so C program files, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft levels, whatever you want, and you can use a lot of them. So you can see the examples of user, username, app data, zip. Um, honestly, like if you have app, I know that there's some programs like WebEx and stuff that are in app data uh, that are EXEs, but most of the EXEs can just be blocked in your app data. But you, you can actually just specify all these paths and then write it as for these paths. Uh, publisher condition is uh, you can select you know, an entire publisher like Microsoft. Only problem with this one is that if you have a legacy code, they modify, they change, and you have not re digitally signed it, and you said, hey, this is from Microsoft or whatever, um, that can be really true. It just depends on your environment. So either I recommend publishing or publishing. Great thing about this, I'm going to go back auto mode. Uh, even if you don't enable this, and you probably won't for a while, you can turn on audit. The great thing about that is that you're going to log every process attempt to open and how any policies that you created will, will affect that process. So if you say, hey, uh, um, the IE Explorer was open, I can actually audit every single process that launches on a new computer. Now for an IoT, it's huge. But we need that data. Now we can look back at if there is an infection, we can we have all the logs in the world to tell us how it worked. All right, so there are some other things out there. Um, if you search like group policy, there's a lot of data. This is actually the secure host base, baseline by the, the DOD. Uh, the, the CIO for the DOD released this. It has a lot of these policies already and tons of more. Um, but you can actually apply these built-in templates for your policy to your test machines and just try them out and see if it works or whatever. It's really easy. You just download them and apply and you're off to the I don't know if you will have heard. Uh, paint. paint is gone. Uh, uh, anyone here? <laughs> Microsoft removed uh, MS Paint from, uh, now it's like in the apps, like their apps or whatever. But uh, yeah, it is dead. And so you saw the theme of grabbing MS Paint to replace all of the slides. Uh, I just wanted to send them out to them. Yeah. Thank you. Questions afterwards, let me know. I'll be around. But also, uh, these are the actual third grade surveys for those who are presentations. So, yeah, if you, you have time, five minutes for questions if you want. So. Oh, you do? Okay, yeah, any, any questions? Alright, well, I'll be, uh, I'll be outside after a Thank you all.